2020's Ouija Shark is another horror masterpiece available on the free streaming service Tubi TV, where if a movie borrows keywords from a popular franchise and has misleading enough cover art, it has a chance at earning royalties. If only it were that easy to market my recent project, The Shining No. 2, which is a self-help book about people with oily foreheads and irritable vowels. But today is all about Ouija Shark and its powerful cast of women who are systematically killed throughout its short runtime. But don't worry, because in between each underwhelming attack scene, we also have our arms and legs ripped off by unfinished character backstories, internal camera microphones, and cinematography that seems to rely on bleak, natural lighting, just like The Revenant. Only in this movie, the bear is more like a rubber shark with a flaking paint job, and it's the screenplay that feels like a relentless, gruesome attack on your body. So it's time to finger that planchette and summon some shark spirits in another horror movie installment of Clip Breakdown Sharky. Hello television viewers, my name is Nick. Thank you so much for joining me once again on my channel for another installment of Clip Breakdown. This is the playlist where we dive into our favorite movies, TV movies, and other content on the web and chop it up like fish chum and throw it into the water to see what we can attract. Either beautiful clown fish who swim in a school or angry fish from the deep who have those like weird bioluminescent bulbs on their heads that I hate. Also, for Clip Breakdown, we've officially entered the era of long table. Oh, look how wide this surface is. I can put my hands here and here. There's so much room for my drinks. I'm like an old-timey bartender. Give me that thing that I drink. Okay. Ugh. But before we get into the movie, make sure you give this video a big thumbs up if you want to see even more clip breakdowns on horror movies from 2B TV like this. But most importantly, if you're new to my channel, I would love to have you click that subscribe button right over here. That way you never miss new videos from me. I upload two new ones every week, so turn on notifications if you always want to know when I'm chumming the waters up with your dead fish brains that you love to eat up like a bunch of little bottom-feeding sharks. You little bottom-feeding sharks, you scum-sucking. I'm just kidding. I don't know why I'm insulting you literally seconds into the video. Let's just dive into Ouija Shark because people have been requesting that I do some horror movies and mama, sweetie, baby, 2B TV is where it's at for horror movies. It definitely seems like this movie was trying to capitalize off the success of the Ouija movie franchise, which started with like Ouija and then Ouija Days of Darkness, I don't know. But then sharks are always in, it seems like, especially with low budget horror movies, sci-fi channel seems to like always be buying those things. So maybe that's what this filmmaker was aiming for. Either way, it's all a vehicle to tell the story of Jill, our main character. Screw it. Time waits for no man. Neither do I. You know when you can just tell that someone has a vape rig in their backpack? Also, I'm already bummed out by this natural lighting with shadows that are even harsher than my snap judgments of this character. Jill is obviously waiting for her friends, but they're not here, so she goes down to this gorgeous looking lake. Not her lounging on a hand towel here at the gravel pit at Broken Glass Beach. She said, I cannot wait one more second to get into my bikini on this cloudy ass day and feel some pebbles digging into my thighs like I'm the corpse on a crime show. But of course, you know, after getting all warmed up in this bright sun, she decides to take a dip to cool off, really buying all of those weather stories. It's funny how my suspension of disbelief can't even get past the color of the day that it is. <laughs> The most tense part of this scene is how she's not wearing water shoes right now. I love how we're supposed to believe she's just like having fun on the beach when just the act of walking to the shore looks like physical foot torture, which is a new type of content I'm offering on the foot fetish tier of my Patreon, as long as you're okay with nine to 10 visible toenail infections. I've been to some depressing lakes in my time. I was a mutated fish in a previous life, but this one looks like, I don't even wanna go to the town that this lake is in because I know they would run my gay ass out of there. That's how bad this this lake looks. It's, it's in a clearly homophobic land. Yeah, that looked really refreshing. You can tell from the pained look on her face the exact second that ice cold lake water rushed into her butt crack. It's also clearly not the type of lake that people swim in. So she's just kind of squatting alone in shin deep water at the haunted lake, which I'm not a marine biologist, but that's basically begging for a ghost shark to come bite that pussy you're basically airing it out in their home. So they're gonna notice those sharks. And one, it seems like some snee creature, snee creature, some sneeze creature comes up to sneeze her. Hello? 
Baby, you're surrounded by open water. Who are you expecting to see over there? An Italian gondolier? He's gonna paddle up like in Venice. He's like, miss, you gotta get out of the water. There's a Ouija shark that's gonna bite your ass. Gonna bite your ass. <laughs> what? Gonna bite your ass. Gonna bite you in the butt. That's Italy. That's Italian. I've never been outside the US. <laughs> I'm just kidding, I have, but not Italy. And also, I don't need to explain my Italian accent to you. Look at my last name and tell me that I'm not impervious to feedback. Jill, get out of this water, okay? You can't even see, it's muddy as hell in the first place. Are you trying to exfoliate with the silt? Oh my god, who was that? Oh, don't worry, it was just a used syringe. Do we have an extra tetanus shot laying around for our lead actress? Or what about some double-sided garment tape for that bikini? Use the fear of your boobs falling out right now to motivate your acting about the turtle that just brushed your foot. Once she gets on the shore, Jill finds the title, well, the first half of the title. Mm-hmm. Oh, I got the same wood-burning kit as a gift for Christmas one year. That toy taught me how to recognize the smell of burning flesh. I don't like how this supposedly supernatural prop looks like it was made yesterday from balsa wood purchased at Hobby Lobby. Treat that prop like the face of a pale Instagram beauty guru and rub brown powder on it until it's unrecognizable. I think low-budget movies like this remind me so much of the movies that I made as a kid because basically no time, money, or effort is available to be put into art, production, design, anything like that. So you're like, let's scramble to get these props together, use what we already have in the house, doesn't matter if it looks good. And I think that's really the mark of a professional piece is when you pay attention to those details and it's actually not that expensive, it's really more time consuming. If you are giving yourself the time to produce your movie, even if you have no crew, you can source the props that are gonna look best or find someone who's interested in doing it for free to help you. That's the kind of creativity that it takes to be a good filmmaker or to partner with a producer who can help you set your work off like that. But either way, as the head artist in charge, you should have the mindset to be like, I want every single detail on frame to look as good as possible. Have I done everything I can, begged, borrowed, and steal to make sure that things look as good as can possibly be when it's in my control. And then of course, things will still go wrong that you're not gonna ever be fully happy with, but that's just the nature of being a creative person. So you gotta do your very best or it's gonna look like slop at the end, you know. Jill gets a phone call that startles her, but it's okay, it's just her friend and because we never know who she's talking to in this scene. Look, where are you guys? I thought we were meeting all at the parking lot in the forest. Why did you think that, Jillian? We're staying at a vacation house, not freebasing cocaine. I thought we were meeting all at the parking lot in the middle of the woods. Like, what are you, the dialogue. You can actually hear when the actors don't know what they're saying and they're just like kind of faking their way through the line. Fine, uh, how do I get to there from the beach? All right, I'll meet you there, okay? All right, bye. Girl, drop the attitude. You're just cranky because this rocky shore has permanently mangled your feet. Also, interesting choice not to show us the other side of that phone conversation. It seems like it would have been a natural place to make some character introductions. But don't worry, I'm sure whatever the screenwriter went with instead will feel equally as seamless. Of course, on her way, Jillian packs that board up with her because she's like into the board. She says, this seems smooth enough that it won't put splinters on my ass. Gonna sit on that board all night. Let's go over to the other friends, our group of girls, girl power, girl boss, girl feminism, go, go, go. I think that was the vibe that the male screenwriter was going for and direct when they put this together. Whose house is this? A friend of my parents. They hired a caretaker to look after it while they were away in Aruba, but I guess they got held up at the airport or something and my parents told them I'd watch the place. I told them only if I could bring my friends. How long will your parents' friends be delayed at an Aruban airport that they need a whole bunch of kids to go watch their empty house? Were they caught trafficking drugs? Also, forget this shot of expositional porch talk with the found footage chaser. What you need to explain is where that moist spot on your shirt came from. Is that iced beverage condensation? Did you guys go to Starbucks on the way here and not ask what I wanted? Good for you, I'm gonna watch you all die in just a minute. These girls all shared one bottle of bedhead beach spray and now they're talking so much. Haha, <laughs> bingo. <laughs> Caretaker must have left already. So no creepy old man to spoil our fun then. Nope. Awesome. To the pool. Ooh, I think we found the actress who took some theater classes in college. Tell me that girl didn't show up on set with a vocal warm up, three acting exercises, and the original Broadway cast recording of Wicked. And that last shot where she's coming around with the keys, I think that was the same camera angle they were using for the 
girl's found footage phone thing because at one point it seems like Kim looks directly into the camera and that found footage thing is so cheap like what since when do you shoot on an iPhone and it has a safety frame with the recording light flashing hmm? it's just an Adobe Premiere preset that you can throw on and just like oh, okay, okay whatever that's when our other main character girl shows up this is my friend Jill my old roomie from college hi I'm Jen. This is Donna and Tiffany. Hi. You can call me Tiff. Hey. Kim, thanks for inviting me. And now I'm also inviting you to cheat out because your back is facing the camera right now. How else are we gonna see that cool septum piercing that you got as a gift with purchase from a tattoo artist? Also, does anyone in the group feel like entering this house yet? You've been standing outside for a long time. Oh, never mind. It was smart to save that reverse shot where Jill would have been talking for this super cut where the girls finally walk up the front steps all the way. They need to prolong this highly cinematic moment because they've been building up to it for the last five minutes. But don't you worry because the interior of this stunning location was well worth the wait. Oh no! I feel like something's got me! It's, it's dragging me towards the pool! The horror! The horror! That's actually a little bit of foreshadowing since I'm going to forcibly drown this character in a little bit. Don't look at me like that. These are fictional characters on a screen. And as someone with editing software, I am their god. And I say it's time to slaughter the these ladies, unless they can save themselves from my wrath with some award-winning comedic timing. She said she wanted to get wet as soon as she got here. What? What? Go. We'll get the rest of the bags. You just make sure she doesn't drown. We will. I can tell that there are supposed to be jokes within this dialogue, but I feel like I'm missing them because they're taking place in a conversation that I'm not part of in the next room. You can tell they used only the camera's onboard microphone for this, which if you're a professional, you know, is always a bad decision. You almost never want the sound of your shot to be recorded exactly where the camera is. And even if you did, if the camera is part of the same device that the microphone is part of in the same body, you're gonna hear the camera noise of the just machinery humming every time the lens moves, every time you press the shutter button. And the worst part is, if you do a wide shot where your camera's out in the hallway, it sounds like you're recording it from out in the hallway. At the very least, the editor would have wanted to take the sound that came from a close-up master shot where you have everyone's voice closer to the camera and then just cut in wide shots using that same audio. But they did not do that. They did not do that. Also, Kim has spent this entire scene lingering near that door like she's being robbed right now. Don't let her leave, no witnesses. Meanwhile, Tip is outside getting a lay of the local land. Oh. She fully just sniffed the air like, smells like mediocre dick is on the menu. And listen, I am not judging Tiffany's vacation vibe. Half the fun of being alive is wearing the wrong shade of eyebrow pencil and getting fucked by the manager at a Valvoline instant oil change. And that's on period, sis. Also, they said, how can we use audio to enhance the sensuality of this scene? Ooh, how about heavy metal drums and the sound of water being sprayed into a tin bucket? Do you, do you need some help? Okay. What if you made her change all the tires? Here's a mechanic's jumpsuit, but leave it unzipped in the front like those ladies in the Carl's Jr. commercials. Now let me welt you with this painful jet stream of water. What sucks about movies like this is that I could still be into it and see past all of these production errors or quirks, you might say, if there was a good story and great characters at the heart of it. I think of movies that were shot on digital video with very little equipment that went on to win like a lot of acclaim. Like the movie 13, that didn't have super advanced production. Just, they put focus in the right areas, like the writing and the sound and the music and the lighting, like in certain points, but a lot of found lighting. Let's look at some opportunities for that type of character development here. Why'd you invite her along? Well, she went through some rough times. I thought this might cheer her up. You know I can hear you guys, right? I was just curious. It's all right. I wanted to know who Kim's other friends were for a while. I'm glad to finally meet you guys. <laughs> Wine coolers? Uh, later. Thanks. I'll have a wine cooler. <laughs> Why is this scene shot from the point of view of a dead body in the trunk? And couldn't we have at least angled the car so the background didn't feature an entire small town's electrical grid? Also, please don't tease me with Jill's troubled backstory if you're not going to satisfy my morbid curiosity later. They drop that plot point like a freshly greased infant. You see, I grease up my babies so that they're easier to slide across the tile floor with the broom. I actually got the idea from indoor hockey. For more parenting tips, bring your child to one of my seminars located inside 
inside of a hot car in a parking lot somewhere. Also, for the first, like, half of the movie, Jill is the party girl. She's like, who wants some drinks? I brought some wine coolers. Who wants some booze? And it's like, all right, girl, we get it. You're here to step on sharp rocks and swell that liver up a little bit. Live your life. This is just another area that falls flat, a montage of them having fun. Like, how hard is it to look like you're having fun? You're human beings, right? You remember fun? <laughs> Like, clearly this soundtrack is supposed to imply something exciting on screen, but this is just real-time girls swimming. Like, they didn't want to get any more variety than these shots from the 2020 Senior Girls Cookout. If they wanted to have a debaucherous, debaucherous, I'll say both just because I'm wrong either way on the internet. If they wanted to have a crazy montage, why didn't they get out of the pool? Like, they're drinking, they couldn't have had them be like, Whoa, we're toasting in the house! Ah! We're playing music, we're spraying silly string, we're, you know, ordering pizza, ar, 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 like literally anything. It could be anything. But they're just like, okay, now splash around in that corner of the pool. Sarah J, why don't you act like you're on the floaty now? <laughs> Okay, there's one girl who's like, you can hear her be like, don't get my hair wet. So it's like, mama. Save this as the last scene of the day so the girls aren't afraid of getting their hair wet for the next scene. The next scene, by the way, is the girls talking about being hungry, wanting booze, not wanting to swim. Like, Jill is just getting mad about not wanting to swim. All of that means nothing. I want to go back to that scene with Tiffany and the neighbor who looks like one of my friend's older brother who I would have had a weird gay crush on as a child. The crush wasn't weird because I'm gay. It was weird because I'm a child. Was a child. I'm old now. Now. This is the part where I talk too much. Let's just play the clip. Your shirt came off. That guy was probably like, you don't want to run inside and put your bikini top on? Or Tiff was like, what? I paid a lot of money for this nursing bra, daddy. Are you not loving these ruffles? Are you not feeling the breeze from my strap flaps? Also, to this music. You're not my problem anymore. <sighs> Hard rock, but it's not really well performed. He's like, I wanna say goodbye. You're not my problem. Like, let's go full voice, daddy, if you're singing hard rock, I'm gonna nickel back country time, angry angst. If you're singing flatbed truck, never went to therapy voice, like, let's do it. And I won't say goodbye, you're not my problem anymore. That's how I would do it. But that's why I'm the world's tour, and you're the local trade. <laughs> What if I just slammed my face into the table until my nose bled and I was like, this is long table era, baby. We're hardcore. We're hardcore. <sighs> Jill takes a nap with her little skull and crossbone earrings, and she has a flashback to that scene at the lake that just happened, so something's up. And Kim is on the grill, cooking up the birds. The way they talk about simple things like lunch in this movie are so weird. That was incredible. I could not eat another bite. Are all the hot dogs gone? Or did they never even exist? These ladies are either eating fantasy food like the Lost Boys in Hook, or they each finished their meal by licking their plate clean like a dog, which I honestly prefer in terms of like comedic mental images. All right, ladies, since you cooked, I'll do the dishes. That's the sound I make when I lick. When I'm eating ice cream, I'm like. I have a really sensitive gag reflex. Mm, I'm sorry. Oh God, why are my plates dirtier than the girls on TV? That's Hollywood. Now that's method acting. Smash, Opa. Me to these plates. You're not my problem anymore. What's gonna happen next at this stupid table? That was incredible, Donna. You are a master at the grill. Hail to the chef. Hail, hail. Cheers. <laughs> Is hail to the chef something that people have ever said? And even if there was, there's no way exclaiming hail, hail was ever the customary response at any point in history. Hail, hail. <laughs> These girls are having such a hard time acting natural that they're becoming medieval knights of the round table. I mean, I get it. Acting is not as easy as people might think, but if I were one of these girls, I would just tap into my own personality, like literally just say the words like you would. And if you wouldn't say that in a serious way, don't say it in a serious way. Just be like saying it so as you be like, hail, hail. Like who cares? It's a dumb movie. So if you just act like yourself, that's literally going to come across a lot better than trying to be this put upon fake ass actress. Like, I mean, they're all pretending to be teenagers when they're clearly like 21, but, or maybe they're 19 or 20. I don't know ages, especially like I'll see gay guys sometimes and they it will be like huge muscles with a beard. And I'm like, oh, he's 38. And they're like, I'm 24. Can you buy me a drink daddy? And I'm like, ah! Ah! 
so I don't know. I'm tripping. The girls are looking for a game to do. I have an idea. What's that? It's in my bag. I'll be right back. Very mysterious. <laughs> She really thought she did something there. She said, bang, smelly swamp garbage and my ladies. Also, where did that wooden die cut heart come from? Because that wasn't on the beach when you found it. She just stopped at Lowe's Hardware on the way over and was like, hey, I'm trying to be the weird girl in my friend group. Is that a, uh, 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 board? <laughs> no, you all ruined it. I would have kept a completely straight face and been like, yes, Donna, that's called a hoo-ha board and you should call it that every chance you get. That way more people get a chance to make fun of her for it later on in life. You got it, Donna. This movie's called Hoo-ha Shark and you're the star. So Jill convinces the girls to play the Ouija board to connect with some evil spirits and things go creepy weird right away. Wait, something's happening. Yeah. Okay, What's everybody happening? keep your fingers on it. Everybody close your eyes and concentrate. Oh, there's my McDonald's Happy Meal hand puppet from Walt Disney's Dinosaur. I haven't seen that thing since 2001. I don't know, I don't like this. Who will be the first to die? Jill. Way to escalate the situation, Jill. She said, don't worry guys, this will be fun. Dear ghost, come f get us. I wish the movie would have used that phone call at the beginning and the gossip at the trunk of the car to establish that Jill had some sort of recently dead relative, someone that she's dying to connect with that would encourage her to be like drawn to this spirit board. Even though they just used that storyline in Annabelle Comes Home and several other scary movies, so it's not new, but at least it makes sense. Or give us something new, like show us that Jill is really interested in mysteries and paranormal stuff, and that would kind of explain her alternative style here or they could make it explain that and maybe while she's at the lake she sees like ripped apart fish or like a dead deer that's head is bitten off or something and she's like what could have done this so close to the water also it's crazy that we're 23 minutes into the movie and we just saw the ghost shark for the first time like this is all about a ghost shark even though the real ghost shark are the dead fish and other aquatic wildlife that are being killed by the day natural disasters that harm our oceans are becoming more and more frequent like the recent gas leak on the west of Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula. There was an underwater pipeline that broke and you probably saw fire boiled to the surface and it created what many describe as the eye of fire. It was very hellacious looking and it scared me to see because I'm like, that's some fried tilapia, mama. Come on. Most recently after the G7 summit, world leaders, including the US, thankfully, committed to protecting 30% of global land and oceans for nature by the year 2030. Like if we can't save 30% of our oceans and our land to not build another cruise ship docking station or an Ulta Beauty or whatever we're doing, then what is up? Like 30% for the fish, we can do that. There are also pledges to reduce carbon emissions by 2030 and basically working to get them back down to 2010 levels. I think this year more than any, we're really starting to have to accept that climate change is happening and it's going to take big actions and really big commitments, not just from us on the individual level, but from corporations and government bodies to slow it down and prevent the worst from happening. Anyway, that's the ghost fish I'm more interested in. The tuna that are dead from fire and fish killings. All of the girls are weirded out by Jill, and I wish they could have played this up more because like she's a little different. She's had this weird, mysterious backstory that we had never heard about, but they could tell us more about. And maybe like some distrust amongst the ranks would add some really cool interpersonal drama to this, but we don't ever get a fully formed view of any of these characters. Not even Jill, who calls her dad tonight. Daddy, it's me. Did I wake you? No, sweetheart. I'm working late tonight. I just had a terrible dream. Dreams can be a doorway to the unconscious mind. Oh, we've got Zelda Rubenstein from the Poltergeist all of a sudden. Or is he just working late as the voiceover artist for an episode of Beyond Belief? Have you ever walked through a graveyard? It could be a strange and foreboding place. Basically, the dad, it's not really told us in any way explicitly, but we see he's like somehow interested in the occult and also holding his mug like this for the whole scene. And he's like, I'm gonna research this and see if I can get back to you with any help. The next day we meet two random new characters who are just sort of thrown into the water, whatever. It's the first time we ever get a glimpse of any character's perspective outside of Jill's or anyone in that group of girls. So I wish they could have set up that we were gonna have little vignettes with featured extras throughout, maybe at the beginning establish that with somebody, like a local townie who's noticing weird things or gets their hand bitten off by a ghost shark. Something like that. A cold open would have been a good start. Uh, are you sure you want to eat now? Wouldn't you rather eat after we swim? 
I skipped breakfast. It's no big deal. Besides, I'd like to catch some rays. Oh yeah, uh, you should totally do that. I, I mean, we can do whatever you like. I would like you to die of a shark attack, since that's what the title of this movie promised me when it played on the screen 30 minutes ago, sis. Also, I'm getting a little tired of these fair-skinned girls acting like they're sunbathing in what is clearly cloudy, unpleasant weather. I mean, I guess that's the safest time for pale people to tan, but it doesn't look fun. Not that I'm a prude and can't appreciate the way that a woman's body looks in like a theoretical, artistic way. Let's just say the milky white boobs aren't part of an oil painting hung up in a museum. I'm probably not gonna be seeking them out in my free time. The awkwardness of these two's encounter, I'm like, girl, they really went for the local talent these days. You couldn't have got some Vancouver actors in? This might be shot in Vancouver. This might just be the best they could afford at the time. Anyway, I'll stop disparaging the actors because that's never a good move. Want some crackers? Uh, you got some, uh, it, uh, happened to me as well. Pardon? Yeah, seriously, what the f*** are you talking about, bruh? I'm not being sarcastic when I say that I'm impressed with how that actor choreographed a piece of cracker falling down her bra. And although my comment is genuine, I recognize that it comes off as an insult by being the only nice thing that I have to say about the movie. But trust me, that is completely intentional. Here's the title- Oh, look, finally, some action! That's all I'll say. I'm mad. I'm mad about it. What the hell is that? Oh my god. Is that a shark? Or a ghost? A g -g 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 ghost shark! And that's exactly what happens. The two lovers split up part ways. The girl is watching from behind a tree and sees her boyfriend get, I guess, eaten, although he just sort of disappears really fast. And then it's her turn. <laughs> I don't know what aspiring horror filmmakers out there watching need to hear this, but learn from my homemade movie mistakes. Throwing a bucket of fake blood at a tree will never look scary or cinematic. I would suggest finding more uniquely grisly scenes to show on screen. Things that we haven't already seen before. Like in Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho, where you see the blood circling the shower drain. That's very memorable. Like, give me something I wouldn't expect to see, like flies feasting on a puddle of blood dripping from a severed hand with that stick in it that that girl is holding. It took me zero mental effort to think of something more disturbing than what they showed me on screen. Couldn't I see that effort from the screenwriter? I'm gonna ask this plant over here. Couldn't I see it from the screenwriter? Mmm, ah, tastes like salad. Back to the girls at the house. Back to the girls at the house. Bam! Sorry, that's just my cousin Donna smoking her morning cigarette in her flags of the world underpants. She has to stay with us till her case is up because we live closer to the courthouse and she can't be late anymore. But no, that is actually marijuana she's smoking because Donna is the stoner character of the group. Tiff is supposed to be like the promiscuous one. There's a stupid one, but none of their characters come through in any more than just like one little joke that falls flat. So here's Donna doing her thing. And alone you shall remain if this is how you act when you smoke weed. Since when does THC put you on an invisible roller coaster? Woo! <laughs> Just cut this scene. Kill the girl. Oh, well, there's something you don't see every day. Wanna hit? I've noticed that only some Ouija shark victims actually get chewed up and others are just magicked away in a flash of light. Is there a reason for this in the shark's lore or did we only mix up a certain amount of red corn syrup? In either case, the friends are being picked up and the remaining girls are hung over from their crazy night that we didn't see. That pancake mix is like a million years old. I already checked. So no brekkie? Well, there's coffee and milk and what we ate last night. No brekkie. Ugh, she can die first for what she just called breakfast. Showing up to a vacation house with cases of wine coolers but no groceries is absolutely a mistake I would make in my early 20s. Not anymore though, now when I travel, any money that I previously would have spent on alcohol is instantly sucked up by pre-cut fruit and Hormel party platters. And you know what? I like that. That's my greasy life. We go back to the dad who's doing more research on the Ouija shark in his dismal kitchen. Why did they like intentionally frame a shot so we have to see the 19th century stove top and old ass dishwasher. Like, I'm depressed already. Three cards spread. Past, 
present and future. Uh-oh, it says shark, shark, and more shark. I hope this normal core paranormal dad gets his own spin-off, where he tries to predict the future for other helpless teens using his trusty stack of blank business cards. The girl who said Brecky goes off to buy groceries, so we know who's dying next. But wait, did you need some more characters? Cause I got a whole handful, a whole crusty fistful for you. Excuse me, officer? I didn't know Susan Sarandon was in this. Oh no, that's just another alert looking redhead. This is Cassie's mother who appears in this one single scene searching for her daughter, who she shouldn't even know is missing yet. And then she disappears faster than that girl who just got raptured at the pool. She's talking to this cop who is not just one cop, he comes with his other cop. Ugh, I'm like, we're 40 minutes into an hour long movie. I want the whole world to die at this point. Missing teens. You get your butt down there, or I'll forget that my wife is your sister and fire your sorry ass. I don't really have room in my brain for that relationship that you're trying to set up. I'm still trying to figure out how there are any missing teens yet when they were all known to be spending a night at this house where no one has even checked for them yet. I mean, it would have been cool if they were like, oh, Jill is running away from her camp counselors who were trying to help her because she was troubled. And she's calling her dad who's on the run in a van or something, you know, give me something cool there. And this is one of the camp counselors trying to find her. But either way, definitely no one's missing. And I, as this movie's sole audience member, probably ever, shouldn't be the one keeping track of all of this for the screenwriter. Like, you're literally the one who's writing it all down. Here's the other cop. He's like a good-for-nothing, do-nothing cop cop. I came my dumb brother-in-law go and check out the stupid Sasparilla Trail. But you're practically already there. I come here for a sympathetic ear, and all I get is grief. Well, can you also get a napkin? Because the liquid glistening on your lips is making me feel like I'm being hit on by the super drunk guy at a wedding. Like, I'm all for having a good time, but I don't wanna be able to use the whiskey aroma in your beard hair to flavor my barbecue sauce. By the way, I'm making barbecue sauce with oils from beard hair, so shave your beard and send it to me in a small jar, thank you. You can buy this product on Etsy under www.hairforeating.com. <laughs> I don't even know why I come here. I assume it's because you're always trying to look down my shirt. Oh yeah, that's it. Guess I'll see you at church on Sunday. See you then. I'm later down. Oof, I guess the risk of giving a speaking role to the actual bartender of your location is that she might perform the can't act head shake, which is the school play thing where one character says a punchline and everyone else on stage is like, Oh, I can't believe he said that, our lovable doofus. Not that her scene partner is doing much better. I'm pretty sure he improvised that last line, which is why they turned off his microphone. If he had a microphone to begin with, but he didn't. Cassie's walking through the woods like, I've got groceries now. <laughs> Not that Aztec death whistle. She said, <laughs> <laughs> Why? Oh, also that brother-in-law got killed in the staircase. So just to pad out the body count, I think. Cassie's running, 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 and running, running, and running, running, and running, running from Ouija Shark. He wants the groceries. Uh, she doesn't really know the Ouija Shark's pronoun, so that's a little presumptuous. I mean, she guessed right, but I only know that because I follow Ouija Shark on Instagram. His handle is Ouija Shark 555. So Cassie gets eaten right here and now, not in a bloody way, just in the flash of light up against a tree way that we've seen over and over again in this movie. Like, not one thought of creativity went to the kills. It was always like, backed against a tree, and then gone. Come on. No one wants to be, you know, dipping their hand into a pickle bucket at the store and then her arm gets ripped off. No one wants to be putting their feet in that little pedicure thing where fish are biting them and then a shark comes up and bites them. Like, that's fun. We've got a supernatural shark here and you're not using the device. The only device we're using is dip dad who I happen to love. You have to find out who that board originally belonged to. I believe they've used it to entrap an animal spirit. I still have no way to find out who the original owner is. Jill, you've denied it for years but your family has a history with the occult. Oh, all of a sudden. If she's been denying that family history for years, she couldn't have kept it up just a little bit longer at the beginning of the movie so that we could see it in the audience? Okay, all I got from her 10 minute introduction is that she also denies the existence of beach towels and flip flops. We're at the 45 minute mark now, so we gotta start ramping up this sh like, we gotta kill some girls with their Target bikinis. Like, let's do it. Starting with this girl, whose name I can't remember. Donna? What? I think they're all named Donna at this point. I know it's Donna, Cassie, Tiff, Tiff's friend, Cassie, Donna. Anyway, get a load of this effect.
Well, at least it was brave of her to die while trying to rescue her friend severed hand? Also, what was with her fast motion movements all of a sudden? I thought she was doing a Benning Hill impression. You can tell that this happened because they had no other shots to cut to. If they had close-ups of her looking into the pool and being like, what is that? What if she was like laying on the raft and then an arm came and floated up and touched her like when they were playing in the pool and she was like, Donna, get off me. Ah, it's a severed hand, you know. All of these tropes that we've seen in other aquatic monster movies that we just don't get here. And again, I'm just suggesting stuff that we've all seen before. They could even go a step further and think of a new sh but I'm not trying to push it. Why should I go back and rewrite every detail of the script when they can't even do a good job the first time? That's what I want to know. So Jill is off and running. This is sort of like the final girl sequence. She finds Tiff, who I guess has been out all night with that Pet Boys worker who I didn't see ever again. Like it could have been cool if we saw him die, if we got a feel for what was going on at Tiff's house. Like maybe she got in the shower and then while she was in the shower, that guy's toilet ate him or something. And then, you know, she's like, well, I guess I'll go back. But no, she's just like, what's going on? And then she runs with Jill. It's a flying ghost shark for crying out loud. That kind of thing doesn't happen. I know, I know. The ghost sharks? Who even thought that was a thing? His name is David A. Lloyd, and he's also written films titled Jurassic Shark and Raiders of the Lost Shark. I'm not a psychologist, but something happened to this person as a child during Shark Week. And that's on Facts on Period, sipping the tea and spilling it, no napkins. The girls make the grave mistake of splitting up or doing other stupid things at the same time. No, we have to stick together. <laughs> ah! Tiffany, keep running, I'll meet you at your car. Just. Just get up and run. Get up and run. Does Tiffany have like really bad joints? Why are they acting like it's gonna take her five minutes to stand up? Jill, you're literally standing completely still while you tell this girl how important it is to be running right now. The movie reminds me a lot of Vanilla County, which is a horror film about zombies that I shot when I was 15 and I've reviewed on this channel. I'll put it in the links because it has that same kind of amateur pacing where it's like shot, shot, shot. Not really using overlapping sound or using any B-roll or subplots to help make things feel like fast moving and exciting or building suspense. Also, it feels like this scene just worked better on the page. Like someone falls and she's too far away and she's like, just get up and run as she's running away. But then once you get on set, you're like, how do I shoot that? She's just yelling it while she's kind of standing still, but panicky. So like you can tell it's improvised and it didn't get storyboarded to like the greatest effect. They could have improved it by having like, I don't know, the Tiff like hurt herself or the shark grabs her leg off and she's trying to crawl while she's being pulled and she's like, just keep running. Whatever, give us some emotional drama to all of this. But nope, Tiff gets eaten right away. So it's time for Jill to suit up and be the hero that she is. This is clearly supposed to be the part in the movie where the hero like accepts their duty to save the day and starts gearing up. But right now I'm just worried that Jill doesn't actually know what a ghost is because leather boots and a spray painted Nerf gun are not gonna be the best weapons for that, mama. Why wouldn't she get like a harpoon gun that has like a cross in it, like a holy cross. So you have to shoot it with a sharpened cross. Like those are funny ideas. She could have found like a cool tool shed and built some crazy weapons. And maybe we got some details earlier on about how she's like an expert at medieval weaponry. And that's like one of her weird quirks, but now it's coming in handy. I love the movie that I'm writing. I don't know what the f this is. <laughs> if you didn't want any more characters because we didn't need them, I'm going to tell you right now you're wrong. What the hell? You can't sneak up on people like that. Where did you get that? It's controlled by the board. I mean, who the hell are you? I know of the board. It belongs to me. The spirit of the shark was placed within it by me. Shark is killed now and will keep killing unless I can return it to the board. I don't know what the fuck she's saying, but girl, I am living. I don't know if this mysterious robed man is like a ghost or an astral projection. All I know is that I wish I had his cool echoey voice for when I'm singing Cher. Hip hop turn back time. This is the previous owner of the board that Jill had to find and use her mysterious latent skills to draw out. She didn't do any of that. It seemed like he just came out of nowhere. What if she was like, like hiding from the shark and he was attacking her and she was like, I connect with the spirits. Tell me who is the owner of the board? You know, or she had to pull from some painful experience that she's mentioned previously to connect with him and meet in the astral plane. I don't know, but like something other than this deus ex machina. Meanwhile, the dad is now visiting a fortune teller for some more camp realness. You've come to the right place, Anthony. I can 
feel the otherworldly forces all dancing around you. What if I was dancing around behind him like, no, that's just me. I'm his sidekick. Not this plastic crystal ball, Madame Zeroni. Clearly a fortune teller of your status could see that that's an oxymoron. Your daughter is in danger. Right now, the beast is hunting her. What can we do to stop it? Well, you could start by showing any amount of concern over the news that your daughter is currently being hunted. He said, interesting. And how long after she dies do I have to wait before I repaint her bedroom? Meanwhile, Jill is really in danger. She runs into this abandoned house that I think would have made a better location for the overall movie, but she's just hiding out in there. Meanwhile, the dad gets an idea with this lady. Hey, over here. Fresh meat! Come on, you son of a- Mama told me there'd be days like this. Just a timely song reference from 1995, wrapped in what I can safely say is the world's worst headband. I don't know why that fortune teller was there since the dad seemed like he kind of was a fortune teller. Couldn't she have been like some sort of a mystical piratey sea witch type of person who lived in a beautiful aquarium? Like, come on, I love the movie I'm writing. I don't know what the f this is. <laughs> I'll say it again. The police officer is one of the only other surviving people right now and he joins up with Jill. <laughs> Why can Ouija Shark magically appear inside of swimming pools, but he can't get through doors and windows? He's ghost. But I guess we shouldn't expect hyper-intelligence from creatures that kill each other in the womb. Like, no, you dumb idiots, you haven't even started life yet. I love how I'm proud and smug about being smarter than a shark. Uh, I hate this movie. There's gotta be a way for the board to get us out of this. Is there anybody out there that can help us? I think it might be time to repaint the orange safety tip of that gun. Does anyone have any black nail polish? Actually, better idea. Let's just wrap the movie up right here and call it a day. The dad is up in heaven doing he ugh, come on. He's still part of this? This is where the movie really decides it does not care anymore. I'm dead. You hear that? You can't! Okay, that was my favorite part of the movie. I've got to use my occult training. Mystic Shield! Creationists are like, and that's how clouds are formed. Also, wait, was that supposed to be heaven or just the sky above the Atlantic Ocean that the dad was battling the shark in? Why heaven? Why does the ghost shark go to heaven? What? And if the dad got eaten by the shark and ended up in the ghost shark plane, then why weren't all the other victims up there? That would have been funny. Whatever. What's stronger than a shark? I have a human spirit. Boo! I'm glad your dad exploded into a firework. Boo! You fish face! All right, I guess we had to get a one-liner like that in there for the trailer. At least it could have been worse. This is for my dad, you aquatic douchebag. Oh yeah, we got a second one, and it was worse. An aquatic douchebag? What kind of aquatic animal even needs to douche? They live underwater. That's like full-time douching. Some fish have all the luck. So Jill shoots the board, which kills the shark. Very creative idea. Destroy the board, destroy the shark. So she could have done this ages ago. And then you can tell at the end of the script, they're trying to do this like, oh, the unlikely pair of survivors walk away from the wreckage as like a pair of anti-heroes. It does not come through in this nicely clean house. Like the, the climax was nothing. Drink. You? I could use about six. The real antagonist of this film was Jill's unaddressed alcohol dependency. And some sushi. Two cents. It literally is. Didn't your dad just die? Also, I happen to know that sushi is made from fish and sharks are a mammal. That's not actually true. I just wanted to say something wrong to see how many people correct me in the comments before they hear this sentence that I'm saying now. Hopefully you guys didn't forget about that robed character because we flash back to him at the end of all of this and get this frightening, unsettling ending. And I mean that truly without any irony. What is it? It's me. Mission accomplished. Everything on the eastern coast has been completed. How did the experiment go? It's really, really, really important. That is the most disturbing Donald Trump impression I've seen since Jabba the Hutt in 1985's Return of the Jedi. And I guess the guy in the robe is just a secret agent who's real and has a lot of natural reverb in his voice. The experiment went very well, sir. We can expect that very soon it can go worldwide. Excellent. Prepare phase two of Operation Ouija Shark. 
it's going to be huge. <laughs> Wait, how did the experiment go very well? The shark was defeated and two people survived. Also, thanks for showing me those chapped, concealer-crusted lips. Now I'll never be able to eat white cheddar cheese curls again. And that's all they wrote for Ouija Shark. You can tell they tried to go for that cabin in the woods. It comes from the top. You know, twist ending at the end, but gee whiz, what a mess of a movie. They couldn't even pad it out to 30 minutes. I'm grateful. Mercifully short. Let me know what you thought of this one below. Also, are there any other 2B TV knockoff horror movies I should check out next? Let me know in the comments and give this video a big thumbs up if you want to see even more TV horror movies on Clip Breakdown like this. But most importantly, if you're new to my channel, I would love to have you click that subscribe button right down here. That way you never miss new videos from me. I upload two new ones every week, so turn on notifications and you'll always be the first to know when we're hunting a shark. Also, I've got merch available and a page. Patreon, where you can access exclusive bonus episodes and virtual watch parties. You guys are all the greatest. Thank you so much for getting into the Ouija board of it all with me today. Chomp, chomp, mom, mom. I will see you next time.